So I am Rajesh Kasturi Rangan. So that's me. And that's Anand over here. And welcome everybody to this Thinking with Data course. Uh, it's a first for NIAS in several ways. So if you've never been to the National Institute for Advanced Studies, well, you are at the National Institute for Advanced Studies. We don't do anything here which is either elementary or medium. We only do advanced studies over here, right? So if you don't want to do advanced studies, I suggest that like, you get up and leave right away. Right? But if you are gung-ho about advanced studying, then this is the place to be. Um, our uh, course on thinking with data is a first for NIAS in several ways. First of all, it's I think the first time we are doing something that's open to the public, but not as a one-time event, but as an entire course. Uh, so those of you who have registered for the course, uh, well, uh, you're part of this experiment and thanks for participating. Those of you who are from NIAS, uh, well, I hope that uh, having so many people brings a new dynamic to the way courses are run. The second thing that we are doing, so Anu here, who works for a company called HasGeek, uh, is going to be videotaping these sessions and we're going to put them online. And there are many people across the country who are uh, interested in this course. So they will be, uh, there will be participation in the course from people who are not in the room right now. Right? So that's the second thing. Um, what I am going to do today is primarily We'll get started with that in a minute, uh, is to lay out the framework of the course as a whole. Right? Uh, many of you have probably not been in school for a while. So how many of you have not taken a course in the last, let's say, three years? By course, you would mean? Meaning like you have not sat in a room every week for, say, ten weeks. Oh, yes. <laughs> right, so that's most of the people here. So, uh, as a result, uh, you know, at NIAS, that's what we do. We are an academic institution, and so we run courses, and which means that uh, there are a few cardinal rules that we always follow, and which everybody in this room did today, because we are going to start at 10.30, and everybody was here by 10.30. But it's a course that starts at 10.30 every Monday. So let me start with the logistics here, right? It will not be in this room from the next week onward. It will be in the main lecture hall in that building, uh, which is actually a much better room for instruction. But unfortunately today, because it was double booked, so we couldn't get that room. And uh, so that's where it's going to be. Uh, it will be two hours of lecture come discussion. So if you are not used to sitting still for two hours, take your Ritalin or whatever drug that you need to and make sure that you can sit in one spot for two hours. Um, the primary way in which the course is going to be organized is lectures here and discussions and projects offline and online. So the projects are really the main thing in the course. Maybe, um, the course is really an excuse for getting some interesting projects done. Uh, and we have a very diverse range of backgrounds here. So many of you, you know, write code for a living and many of you write words for a living. So hopefully the people who write code will talk to the people who write words and do something interesting in combination. And some of you probably even draw pictures for a living. So pictures, videos, uh, words and uh, code or programming, so broadly speaking. Right? So all this, every one of you here is going to be assigned to a project. Uh, we still haven't decided on the final projects, partly because we didn't know how many people were going to show up. So broadly speaking, about between, I mean, there are, let's say, 30 people in this room, and some of you might be coming in and out. So we'll have about five projects, five for for uh, project, five people for project. And if that, uh, if the way we want to do it is to mix people of different backgrounds so that uh, some you know, people who have interesting questions get combined with people who have interesting ways of addressing their questions. So the projects are the real test of learning. 
it will happen as much online as in this room because once you leave the room, you can of course go and check back on the lectures. Uh, we will uh, potentially be hosting this uh, class in an other, another location, at the Center for Internet and Society at the other end of Bangalore, in Donglu, uh, where if you can't make it during the day, but I hope all of you who have signed up are going to come here on Monday mornings, but if you know people who are interested but just cannot come on Monday morning, we are hoping that it will be hosted on a weekend or on our weekday evenings uh, at the Center for Internet and Society. So that's the other thing. So which means that there will be people who want to participate in the course who are not coming here. And so some of the online discussions will be important. Right? So the first thing you need to do, if you haven't done so already, not register for the course, but to register on the site. Right? Because once the project groups get divided and we're all assigned to a project group, we want that group to be documenting its uh, progress. And the only way we can do that is by doing it online. So please do uh, document your, uh, go to the website and register. So there's a register right there on the front page. So you should be able to find that out. And we will use those registrations to drive the projects, right? So uh, hopefully once next week, you will, by next week, you should have a project. And every week from then on, we will hope that you will submit as a group, not as an individual, something in the project. Prerequisites, and Anand is going to talk about this later as well. We don't expect too much in the way of prerequisite knowledge, but we do want to warn you that some exposure to Python and HTML will be desirable, right? So if you want to get the maximum out of the course, now this is not a course except for the NIAS people who are taking it for credit. Uh, everybody else is doing it for fun or some other noble cause, right? So, for, so really, you don't need to do anything, but if you want to get maximum benefit out of the course, you do need to know enough Python or HTML to do the assignments. Ideally, uh, you are part of a group where there are other people in the group who know some of this stuff. So they'll be able to help you out. But we are going to organize a crash course next weekend uh, at Graminer in Indranagar. Anand again mentioned that and if you therefore are interested in getting that crash course, I especially urge the NIAS people who I am almost certain none of you have actually written a line of code in your life. So if that is the case, please do sign up for this crash course. Right? Um, so these groups will be mixed so that you complement each other's expertise. Um, let's put it this way that you know, 500 bucks for an intensive workshop in Python and HTML, uh, you're not going to get that deal uh, again, right? So, that's the, the perks of this course are going to astonish you right, as the course goes on. <laughs> okay, so what are our goals in uh, doing this course? So, it's really an experiment in several things. The first is, at least from my perspective, I Think of this as a core course. So for people who are not from NIAS and also the first year NIAS students, you know that we have um, these two foundation courses at NIAS, right, that everybody is supposed to take. So I think of this course as a kind of foundation course, meaning these are skills that everybody should have and unfortunately because they are new or they are packaged in a way that uh, are not done in the same way elsewhere, you're unlikely to get these skills as part of a single package, right? So extracting data, analyzing it, visualizing it, thinking about it as you do all of those is something which is a standard skill. It's like learning how to do quadratic equations, right? Uh, and I'm sure there are people here who don't know how to do quadratic equations either. So please add quadratic equations to your list of things that you should know. But uh, in this course, we will be essentially teaching you thinking skills that will hopefully be useful whatever you do. Okay, And the uh, mark of that success is how you can execute some interesting projects. And I'll come to what kind of projects which would be interesting. 
when I say interesting, I don't mean that they are just interesting to a classroom. I mean projects that if you do well will be either publishable if you're an academic or will have some value to you as a business person if you're in industry or if you're in a civil society group, it will allow you to uh, do your campaigns in ways that you cannot do otherwise. Right? So that's so the interesting is defined by the, the world outside, not by this uh, solipsistic system here. Right? So the projects combined with the skills are really a way to bootstrap a community. Now Anand here has been organizing data meets for a while. So you know, working with big data is now something that lots and lots of people are interested in, but uh, not too many people know how to do it. And I would venture that knowing how to think with data is an even rarer skill, partly because, as I will say in a bit, uh, the nerds and the geeks don't talk to each other. Right, so what do I mean by that? The geeks are, so in case you want to understand this sophisticated terminology, uh, geeks are people who write code for a living and nerds are people who write words for a living. I mean, this is my very, very simple way of distinguishing those two. So uh, broadly these two don't talk to each other, right? And my guess is that most of you who came from the geek world until you signed up for this course and you came to NIAS, you probably did not even know what NIAS was, right? And, and in the nerd world, that it wouldn't be that uncommon knowledge. And the other way around, like we actually don't know what you guys do in Indianagar and Jayanagar and all those places, right? So, so the idea is that the people who write code will find interesting problems to work on with people who write words and vice versa. Okay, so this really is where uh, the proof of the pudding is going to be. Okay, so let me start with examples of things that I feel are thinking with data kind of examples. So they they have certain characteristics. So let me uh, start with an election campaign. Now suppose you are trying to, you are a politician or you are a pollster or you are a campaign manager and you want to run a good election campaign, right? And incidentally, if you are working for an NGO who wants to run a campaign, same kind of uh, ideas. How would you do that? And how would you use data to do that? Now to give a, an example, uh, there was a graduate, my friend Ashwin ran for the graduate constituency in Bangalore. Now, Bangalore has 1.1 million graduates. So, the constituency in principle had a million and you know, 1.1 million people in it. It turns out that only 23,000 of those voted. Right? So, look at the percentage. And the winner won by 400 votes. So, which means that 400 out of a million was the deciding uh, Vote, uh, percentage, which is what 0.025, no, yeah, about 0.025 percent, it's slightly uh, less than that actually. So, which means that a very minuscule percentage of people decided the winner, and incidentally, it turns out, and in fact, I think there is a lawsuit that's going to happen. The the person who came second can convincingly argue that votes that were disqualified because somebody instead of just so ticking the right candidate's number ticked their name and then put a circle around it or put a circle around the whole candidate's name. So if you just take these kind of what you call uh, completely certain but disqualified votes. So people whose intention was absolutely clear but they just did something that got them disqualified because of the rules um, are something like 750 and most of them went to the person who came second. So actually it turns out therefore that the difference between the winner and the loser can be covered by just these disqualified votes. I mean if you remember there was a US election uh, which now increasingly decides the way the world has run for the last 10 years uh, was also decided in the same way, right? So 500 votes in Florida was the difference between Bush and Gore. So 
what this is telling you is that if you want to run a good campaign and you know winner take all kind of system where the winner gets everything the loser gets nothing so if there's such a small difference between the winner and the loser you need to run a very very sophisticated campaign so that you get every single vote that you can get Right? And, and I think that the Obama-Romney election, for example, will be decided in exactly that way. Uh, in fact, already people are saying that there are about 400,000 voters in a few districts in perhaps Ohio, Florida, Colorado, and a couple of other states who are going to be the difference between Obama's winning and Romney's winning. Right? Again, out of a possible electorate of about 160 million so these very very you can't just look at the data and ask how to run a campaign to make your guy win because it's very unlikely that you will without prior hypotheses about how to understand the data you are not going to be able to pick out those 400,000 people or those 400 people who are the difference between winning and losing right so how does one run a campaign in a way that you get exactly the people that you know you're going to get. Right? I'm sure it's going to happen sooner or later that you'll have Facebook ads for vote for so and so. Right? And it may, if they're smart, what you see when you uh, view vote for so and so will be different from what the next guy sees when they see vote for so and so. And, and that kind of smart analytics um, is not too far. But if you don't know how to do it, or you think that it's magical, then you are going to be suckered. Right? So if nothing else, we need to know this how, so that you're not um, being propagandized. Now the second thing I want to talk about, so this was not quite in the geek world, but at least it's something that a lot of you might uh, easily understand, uh, the microbiome. So how many people in this room have heard the term microbiome? Okay. And who haven't heard it from me? <laughs> okay, so the microbiome is the bacteria that live in your gut. It's as simple as that. And it turns out that there are 10 times as many bacteria in your gut than there are cells in your entire body. So in that sense, you are justifiably just the, the house in which those bacteria live. As far as they are concerned, you're, you know, you, you are not a person, but this entity which houses them, right? Now it turns out again that these, so if you have 10 times as many bacteria in your gut as your cells, you can imagine that these interact in very, very interesting ways with you. It also turns out that all of us have a unique microbiomic signature. Right? So every single person has a unique microbiome and, and, and this is amazing, so you should read this in The Economist uh, in the latest one if you haven't uh, done it already. If you have identical twins, identical twins may still have differentiated microbiomes and that might be the difference in let's say nutrient intake. So it may turn out that people who are thin are different from people who are not, not because of their genes, so to speak, but actually because of how their genes interact with their microbiome. So this kind of personalized medicine of actually analyzing this microbiome is going to become huge. I mean, the, the microbiome project just released its data about a month ago. And India, for example, I mean, it would be fantastic to do a large scale microbiome project in India, right? So you can imagine the kind of stuff that lives in our gut. Uh, and uh, the microbiome diversity of India, if anything, will rival the human diversity of India. So if that's the case, you can imagine the kind of interventions in public health that you can do in a country like India if you understand this microbiome well. And that can only happen if you take people who know how to diagnose pe uh, diseases or other uh, medical interventions with people who know how to analyze data. 
right? Ideally, it should be the same person. But right now, your average doctor who writes that uh, scribble on a piece of paper wouldn't know, you know, standard deviation from, you know, variance, right? Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but but typically they wouldn't. So therefore, this kind of skill, I'm saying, is standard. It should be something that all of us know. And once we do, we'll be able to do our job better. So addressing these questions requires what I call thinking with data. So it's not just data, it's not just analysis, but it's thinking with data. What do I mean by that? So there's a kind of bottom-up way of understanding data. And when I say the bottom-up, it means collecting the data, run some statistics on it, show some significance, and then call it quits. Right? This is what a lot of us do even in the academic world when we are collecting data on, let's say, you know, is, um, let me make up something, right? is uh, tuberculosis correlated with um, cost? Okay, I'm just you know, to take two things. So, now, you may collect a lot and lot of statistics about who has TB in India and what costs they do, but typically, the kind of analyses that will happen are of a bottom-up kind, which is to say, the correlations between these two categories, TB and cost. Now, of course, there will be something significant there. You can be pretty much be sure that lower caste people in India are more likely to get TB than upper caste people. But Unless you talk to a sociologist or to an uh, anthropologist, you won't really understand why is it that uh, upper caste, I mean we have some intuitions as to why upper caste people are more less likely to get TB, but to do a genuine public health analysis, you would need to do something more than just what the data in front of you tells. Right? You need to embed that data in a broader understanding of how society works. And that is not going to come from machine learning. I mean, at some point in the future, there might be a machine that crunches uh, political science and anthropology and sociology and just figures all of this out. But until then, it's people who really understand how experientially the world works who will have to talk to people who know how machine learning works. Right? So the data is actually much more interesting if you can tell a story, right? So again, if you take cast and TV, you can tell some very interesting stories about the relationship between caste discrimination and public health, right? So one very obvious um, kind of story to be told is about the access to water that somebody who's of an upper caste background has versus somebody who is from a lower caste background has. Now that kind of uh, story about how access to water, clean water, I mean, uh, determines public health is, is pretty clear, but you need to plot carefully across India, let's say, what kind of water do people have access to and what is the caste distribution of that. And, and that would give you a much better story about how TB and uh, uh, caste are related. So which is why some data points are more relevant than others. And we need to figure out what, where that relevance comes from. Right? Where do you get what is more valuable data? You can't get it from the data itself right now. So there are learning algorithms that are beginning to get those out of the data itself. Right now, you need to be able to tell me why some data is more relevant than some other data. You need to be able to explain the significance of a finding. Right, you need to be able to convince me that this particular data point is actually far more important than some other data point. Now let me give you an example which we all sort of think of as self. Right? You know that the earth goes around the sun instead of the sun going around the earth. Right? But every single day you get one data point which suggests that the sun goes around the earth. You wake up and it looks like the sun is moving and the earth is still. So every single day we are collecting data on why the sun is going around the earth and yet at least our current science suggests that it's the other way around, it's the earth that goes around the sun. So how do you ever show that? 
what is the reason why you believe that the earth going around the sun data which was painstakingly say collected by Copernicus by looking at the um, sort of epicycle sort of uh, regressive motion of the planets is more relevant than your everyday experience. I mean that suggests that there's some theory in the background that tells you no this data is more important than that data. And that's what you could argue that Sherlock Holmes sort of taught us. Right? I mean there's a very famous quote in one of the Sherlock Holmes stories, I don't know which one it was, maybe somebody here knows, that if you if from the improbable you take away that which is impossible, what you are left with is the solution. I don't know if Anand is probably online so he can Google it. <laughs> but, but that really is, should be what I call the data actives um, method. Like you need to know what kind of data is relevant and what is it. Incidentally, again, if you remember at the beginning of Sherlock Holmes, Watson makes this list of things that Sherlock Holmes is good at, right? He doesn't care about the earth going around the sun or the earth, sun going around. So he has no interest in broader culture. But he's extremely good at identifying where each soil fragment comes from, right? So that kind of real eye for detail and knowing which things matter to your particular form of expertise, I think is one of the great um, skills of a good data scientist. So do people actually think with data? Now, this is where my work as a cognitive scientist becomes interesting. You know, we all would like to believe that we are rational, um, smart, data-driven, uh, analytic people, but actually people are not. So a very interesting experiment by Lara Koroditsky, who is at Stanford, showed the following thing. So suppose I take a group of people who are given a story, a description, which either has some statistics in it, or has a metaphorical description in it, or both. So an example would be, crime in LA rose by 17% last year, versus, so that's the uh, statistical fact, or, there was a crime wave in LA last year. Now it turns out that if you do a control experiment and they did a very interesting um, control experiment, it turns out that people who are given the data and the metaphor perform much more like the people who are given only the metaphor versus people who are given only the data, except that they all say that they use the statistics. So they think that they are thinking with statistics, but they are actually thinking using the metaphor. So that goes back to the previous thing, right? That telling the story, metaphors help you tell a story much better than raw numbers do. And therefore, even if you want to be data driven, what you do with the data and how you represent it, either visually, or numerically or uh, whatever other modality you use will actually be far more relevant to the end user of that data than the raw numbers will be, right? And my own bet therefore would be that diagram. So if somebody draws a diagram which goes probably like this, right? So these are the two axes, right? And somebody shows that that's how crime is going, right? So it's like an S-shaped curve. That would be far more convincing. The numbers on it will not be convincing, but the shape of the curve would be far more convincing than anything else. Right? So, uh, so what I'm saying therefore is that thinking with data and doing it in a way that um, takes all of the sensory modalities that we have, whether when visualization, of course, is the most important one, but other sensory modalities is actually not a bad idea. Right, so this way that the stories are told with data should learn as much from storytelling in other kinds of stories as with um, statistical and other analysis data. Can I uh, go ahead? As you're talking about this, my mind is going towards Kahneman, uh -huh. the use of heuristics in uh, decision making that we make. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so this so is all tied to that. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Right, 
So if you are thinking with data, you are just using data as a tool for your thought rather than being the end. So, so unless you are a statistician, data is something that you use for other purposes rather than just crunch it. Right? So you should be able to synthesize your findings, tell a good story. Right? So in that sense, thinking with data is not about artificial intelligence. It's not really about machine learning as much as it is about how humans can do the things that they are already doing, but with data in a better way. So for example, if you want to persuade somebody, so if you're a business which wants to say, buy my product over the next guys, you are actually communicating a story. Right? So how do you do that better with data? Same thing if you're a public official, if you are a scientist, any of those things. Right? So if you look at diagrams in science journals, like I often have a very hard time understanding you know, uh, figures in science journals because they're so opaque. So I would say that there a huge revolution in science can happen just by if everybody is forced to read Edward you know, two fifty's books like three times. Okay. Behind all of this, and which actually has been severely questioned by the Kahneman, Tversky's, and others in the world, but nevertheless, the ideal model is that of the rational agent, right? So a rational agent is somebody who thinks with data by extracting as much information as possible from the data and communicating it to the world. Right? So the idea is there is data, you can extract information and you can convey what you extract as succinctly as possible and the rational agent is someone who maximizes both of those, right? who maximizes both the extraction and the communication with minimal resources. So broadly speaking, any kind of information designer would try to design systems which help you extract as much as possible and communicate as much of that extracted information in as efficient a manner as possible. Okay, so people may not be perfectly rational. So uh, again, this Lera Borovitsky work that I mentioned and work by Kahneman and Tversky about heuristic biases and others have shown that we are actually not rational beings. But nevertheless, we can aspire to be one. Right? I mean, rationality is something which is a desirable goal even if we actually are not rational and you could argue that because the data, if it is collected accurately without error, doesn't lie, uh, you would be, act be able to predict the world better than the guy who uh, is making up stories that are not grounded in the data. Right? So, so just because other people are irrational doesn't mean that you should. So for example, so if, when I say RA, I mean the rational agent. So suppose you are a government investigator, and so here is something that would be, in India, a very, very important public health intervention to be done, right? We all know that there are all kinds of fake drugs in India. You want to know where those fake drugs come from. Or, not in the fake drug domain, we know that in India, doctors often over-prescribe antibiotics. So you want to know where, so if you are fi finding out that there are new TB uh, bacilli that are more and more resistant to drugs, you want to find out where is the over prescription to antibiotics coming from so that you can do something about it. So how do you use data to figure out where in India is the source either of these spurious drugs or of the antibiotic over prescription? Now similarly, at the other end, imagine a Kirana store, right? So just walk up and down the Matikere road over here, you will see lots and lots of small stores. Now, you, they all have to make a living and their living depends on having only those things in stock that they sell and as few of those things in stock that don't sell, except that of course, you don't want to be completely out of stock of things that are only rarely sold, right? So how do you, again, maximize your inventory in such a manner that it depends on the data that you're getting from the world about uh, interest in those products? So you're a stationary store outside. You have, you know, 
various thicknesses of books some are hardbound some are paperback you want to on the one hand you want to make sure that people buy the most expensive uh, hardback book that you have but most people don't want that so how do you market how actually how do you structure your store so somebody comes in they need to see your store you how do you lay out your store so that people buy the most expensive thing that's on your in your stock and yet they also get what they want if they know exactly what they want right so this is a kirana store you might think that they actually don't want to spend too much time thinking about layout design or data collection but actually if anything they will their business model will be far more efficient if they did so than a large chain like you know food world or uh, reliance time out or something like that where they have people on the payroll who are doing that right so how do you get how do you make and <clears throat> data so transparent that a kirana store owner can also use data to maximize their revenue now that's a that's sort of a small business model right and note how imperfect your knowledge of the world is and how little time you might have to make sense of it so take again that kirana store guy he is only getting input from the customers in front of him unlike reliance time out he doesn't have access to data from across the country or even from his neighbors who who are telling him what's selling and what's not so you have to make decisions on the basis of extremely impoverished information okay and you want to do it in such a way that um you, you can react to the world immediately rather than many years in the future in the long run we're all dead as they say so you have to make the invisible visible and this is what mathematics was supposed to do my mathematics makes the numbers and quantification makes the invisible visible uh, so you want to be able to measure the world you want to analyze it and visualize it all while being a rational agent and by doing so after the, uh, the end product of the visualization should be something that makes transparent what was completely inaccessible before so for example it may turn out that if you take three or four products that are in stock in a kirana store there is a clear pattern as to what at what rate they are being consumed and therefore at what rate you need to order it so thinking of data if you take these three things here as the goals is therefore what you have to think so i am again coming as a theorist where the thinking comes first and the data comes last and i might want to flip that a little bit but uh, you know we will play uh, the good cop and the bad cop with each other with that uh, so if you think first you extract data on the basis of the hypotheses that you derive when you think and from that you combine the thinking and the hypotheses you have a reasonable chance of success incidentally this is what happens in what's called bayesian reasoning right so you have a hypothesis and you have a hypothesis that says the sun goes around the earth and another hypothesis that says the earth goes around the sun and then i go test the world in some way and then i combine the outcome of that test with the hypothesis that i already have and say oh it's the earth that goes around the sun so that's what people think an ideal reasoner should be doing right. so what is thinking um now there are many many definitions and you know if you are a professional student of concept formation and reasoning and so on you have many different ideas of what it is to think but for us it's just the capacity to form beliefs to reason about those beliefs once you have formed them and to test those beliefs against the world right that is broadly speaking what i consider thinking it's something that starts with a belief and ends with a hypothesis that you can test against the world okay so suppose that you leave your house in the morning so this is the monsoon season you leave your house and you see water on the pavement in front of your house was it rain a water main that burst the gardener spraying water all over 
which one of those things is it? So thinking about forming one of these beliefs, so a belief, one belief would be it rained yesterday night. Another belief would be a water main burst yesterday night. A third hypothesis would be the gardener was watering the plants uh, 10 minutes ago. Right? So these beliefs are the first part here. So you have the capacity to form beliefs. Then you reason about those beliefs. And then finally test those beliefs against the world. Right? So how would that happen? Right? Now it's August. We all know it's been raining. So this year it wasn't raining until recently. So you see water in front of your house and you form the belief that it must have rained yesterday night. You even heard some thunder potentially. Right? So you did not form this belief on the basis of explicit reasoning. Like most of us, when we leave our house you know, with an umbrella or something like that, we are not explicitly reasoning in our heads saying, oh, I saw you know, lightning and therefore I must leave with thunder. No, it's like I'm subconscious, you hear thunder, you pick up the umbrella. Right? So therefore, this first step is sort of, it's not explicitly rational. So we need to first convert, in order to do data science, you need to convert the subconscious intuitions into explicit beliefs that you can reason with. Right? So how would you reason explicitly? So the first kind of check in your reasoning system would be, is it plausible to assume that it rained yesterday night? Now, the way one would defend it Incidentally, this is what Indian logical systems do. Right? So the famous, famous example in the Indian philosophical logic is um, it, you see some um, smoke and you conclude that there was fire, right? And so where there is smoke, there was fire. How do you do that? You say that, well, wherever you have seen smoke, there was fire, like for example, in the Chula, and therefore, in this case, because there is smoke, there must be fire. So that's an example of reasoning with data, right? There's, da there's a middle point, which is data, that whenever I cooked chapatis or whatever in my house and there was smoke, it was caused by a fire. Right? So that thinking with data is souped up is what really we are talking about, right? So we are saying, okay, it's August, it's cloudy, there's water on the ground, and therefore it must have rained, okay? Now, if you are a rational agent again, you have to test that belief. So for example, there might be water in front of your house, but there's no water in front of any other house. Now, again, you have a tacit understanding that if the rain fell from the sky, it wouldn't have scattered rainfall so non-uniformly that there's water in front of your house and not in front of the next sky. So, Think about it this way, right? So, therefore, tacitly there is an understanding of the probability distribution of water on the ground given that there has been rainfall. Okay? There is no smell of rain. Okay, as we all know, there is a sort of distinct smell of rain when it first comes on the ground. And therefore, you conclude that maybe rain is not the correct belief. That even though it is August and it could be rain, actually is not rain. Then you go around and you notice that there is water gurgling next to a drain, right? And therefore, because there is water that's gurgling from a drain, no other drain is gurgling, and therefore you conclude that it must be the water in your drain that, I mean, the drain being clogged that must have led to the water in front of your house. I mean, most of us are really not that rational, but I, this is what you should be. Right? Uh, actually, even this need not really be true. Because it's the rainy season and there is a lot of water, it's much more likely now that a drain is clogged because of excessive water than in some other parts of the year. So actually, the real re reason could be a combination of both rainfall and water blockage, right? which is to say that this particular drain got blocked because of excessive pressure on that particular system 
as opposed to some other drain which were able to handle the rainfall that came about. Incidentally, this is how medical reasoning goes, right? So if you're trying to diagnose what disease somebody has, this is exactly how you would go about doing it. So suppose you want to find out somebody is having, let's say, pain in their left arm a lot. Is that due to a heart condition? Is that due to a pinched nerve? Or is that due to muscle strain somewhere else in the body? All of these are plausible hypotheses. In fact, the real world is always like this that conditions don't all come to you cleanly saying this is what it must be. Because we are complex systems, both our bodies and the world outside, symptoms are clustered in ways that it's often hard to find out what is the actual cause of the affairs in the world. And therefore, one shouldn't be, one should be very careful about jumping to conclusions. And that's where actually big data helps a lot because what big data helps you do is to repeatedly test your hypotheses against the world as opposed to just doing it once, right? So if all of this sounds familiar, it's nothing but the scientific method, right? That's what actually science is supposed to be, right? A scientist is somebody who performs hypotheses, goes and tests those hypotheses and then tells you whether that hypothesis is valid or not. So what I'm trying to tell you the geeks in this room and everybody else is that it actually will benefit you a great deal if you just understand how the scientific method works. So all this thinking of data is nothing more than the scientific method but just done more carefully and thoroughly than most scientists normally do. Right? So the scientific method in some sense was created with small data in mind. And so if you look at how many data points Copernicus had before he concluded that the you know the earth goes around the sun my guess is that it would not pass a single journal current journals uh, statistical significance test right now uh, I mean that doesn't mean that it wasn't a fantastic piece of science it's just telling you that our standards for how much data is actually relevant have changed since then so can we scale the small data mentality of science? So from my perspective, what's really, really fascinating about the big data business is that you now have the capacity, if nothing else, to test your hypotheses against much larger data sets than you ever were able to before. And that's true, as much true for a businessman or for a public official or anybody uh, as it is for a scientist. Right. So what we need is techniques not just to crunch the data, but how to understand it better. Right. So another way of putting it is, what's the science in data science? So is data science just a fancy term for statistics? Well, that's actually not such a bad thing. Right? I mean, statistics is a fascinating, fascinating uh, subject. And it arose precisely to quantify how to understand large data sets. So if you look at insurance policy, well, mathematicians discovered the normal distribution and that drives insurance policy, right? So you could argue that what's happening in the big data world is that we are finding out that the old normal distribution, the bell curve, so to speak, doesn't work anymore. That most real world data sets don't fit a bell curve and therefore, if you want to be able to reason accurately about large data sets, you need other kinds of statistics than normal statistics. But broadly speaking, there are two kinds of statistics. One is what's called frequentist. So you count the number of times something happens. So you toss a coin 100 times and you find out that it came heads 47 times and tails 53 times. And you keep doing more and more of those and you find out that as the number of observations grows larger and larger, the coin more or less settles to 49 heads and 51 tails. So you conclude it's a biased coin with a probability of heads being 0.49 and a probability of tails being 0.51. So it's not an ideal coin anymore. Right? So that's how one derives the distribution. But a Bayesian doesn't do it that way. They don't get their data 
their distributions from the world, they start with an assumption. So for example, you can assume that the coin is fair. Right? So you start with the assumption that it's 50-50, you make 100 observations and you find out that again 47 and 53 and then you recalibrate on the basis of that as to what is the most likely distribution that could have generated 47 heads and 53 tails. And you keep doing that again and again until you settle down upon something. Now ideally, in the long, long run, the two should converge, right? So if the coin is indeed biased, your beliefs about how the coin works should converge to actually how the coin works. But in the real world, you never get those large n number of observations. You have to make your decisions now. And that's the hard problem, right? So big data actually shifts the debate away from long n decision making to very, very rapid decision making. So if you want to do science with statistics, and you want to do all kinds of sciences with statistics, what if we derive our science on the basis of statistical rather than deterministic assumptions becomes a very important kind of uh, science to do, right? which in practice most uh, social science disciplines are like that, right? or biology also for that matter. Unlike physics, we are not based on deterministic assumptions. Right? We don't have strict rules that say people will only go from Delhi to Mysore. No, there will be some uh, distribution of people who go from Delhi to Mysore and you don't throw away your theory that Mysore is say the center of let's say yoga in India, right? Uh, because there are some people who are going to learn yoga in you know, Indoor rather than Mysore. Okay. Uh, so the kind of science that we do is often driven by statistics rather than deterministic assumptions, but the more we do and the more statistics we collect, I think the more the different kinds of science we can do now. So to just give you a brief idea, that Newton invented the calculus to solve this Copernicus problem. Right? How do you explain the fact that the Earth goes around the Sun in such a way, incidentally, right? these are Kepler's laws, that in a certain given period of time, say one month, independent of where the Earth is, or independent of where some other planet is, it always covers the same area in the same period of time. Right? So in one month, whether it is January to December, uh, no, uh, to February or October to November, it's still the same area. This is what Kepler discovered in his laws and Newton was trying to figure out how to do that. And he of course invented the law of gravitation and he invented calculus and he put the two together and he said this explains how one can get the Kepler's laws. Right? So we are essentially trying to do something here which is not that different. We have huge, huge data sets and we want to explain quantitative as well as qualitative behavior on the basis of those data sets, but we don't quite have the calculus that helps you convert the data into insights. Right? We're still groping in the dark as to what that calculus is. And the reason is partly because thinking with data is not like thinking with, I mean, thinking with big data isn't like thinking with small data sets. So if you take very, very large data sets, which are dynamic, so let's take Google's servers that are processing huge amounts of data every second, or uh, Airtel, which is processing, I don't know, how many millions of calls per second. It's very different from the Copernican model of data collection where you stare at the same thing every year and you can go back and you can go back and it's always going to be pretty much the same. Right? So where the moon was on January 27th of 2001 is a lot like where the, June is, uh, the moon is going to be on January 27th of 2002. But in these very, very large dynamic data sets, that kind of regularity is simply not there. Right? And so if you think that data science is about extracting the patterns that underlie the data generation, we need to have much more sophisticated idea of what patterns are. Right? So, what I mean is, if you take a flashlight, 
So this is a famous Birbal story, right? Remember Birbal was asked by Akbar, find me the 10 stupidest people in Agra and come back the next day. And so Birbal is walking around and somebody is, you know, there's a lamp somewhere and this person is frantically looking for something. And uh, Birbal says, well, what are you looking for? And he says, oh, my wife gave me this very valuable gold ring and you, sh you know, and I lost it and I can't find it anymore. And so Birbal also helps him for like an hour and then Birbal finally says, wow, you can't find it, where did you lose it? And the man says, oh, well, over there, right? And then he says, well, why are we looking for it over here? He said, well, at least there's some light here, so you know, there's a chance that we might find it, but over there it's impossible. So a lot of uh, sort of data poor science is, is like that, right? You're shining flashlights in the dark and you're hoping that you'll hit something that's interesting. But that's not the way our minds and brains work. When you think about it, every single time you open your eyes in the daylight, you see the world, right? It doesn't appear to you as flashlights that are um, shining in the dark. I mean, in fact, we take it so much for granted that the world is what you get when you open your eyes. I mean, just imagine what your sensory experience of the world would be if it was like sporadic flashlights and like that. Right? That's not, I mean, so our brains and minds are the original big data thinkers. I mean, every single second you're processing billions, in fact, trillions of photons that are you know, hitting your retina, then going through your uh, primary visual areas and then being processed further, so on and so forth, all the way till you get to the higher cognitive areas that say, oh, this tiger is chasing me or something like that. And it all has to be ha happen like that, right? So our brains, therefore, are actually geared to process data quickly, efficiently, and um, hopefully accurately. Right? So that kind of dynamic, continuous data, I think, is what's going to be the future of where big data is going to go. And that's, in a sense, that's what excites me, because what it tells me is that the object of study of my science, which is the mind and the brain, seems to dovetail really well with the evolution of technology as we see it right now, right? So that big data technology will hopefully tell us and inform us and under, help us understand how our brains and minds work and the other way around, right? That more and more understanding of how our minds and brains work will also help us design better data analysis techniques. So this I think of as the AI challenge of the 21st century, right? Way back when, in the small data days, people wanted to build AI computers or robots that would think like human beings. Famous Turing test, where the idea is that if you can design a computer that is indistinguishable from a person, it's as intelligent as we are. Right? So imagine what the big data version of the Turing test is going to be, which is that if you can take a computer which can process visual information in a way that is indistinguishable from our visual system, you've cracked what it is to understand how human vision works, right? And vice, vice versa, if you understand more of how human vision works, you might be able to build better image processing or other kinds of visualization technology. So this combination of the two is what I think is going to, it already is, and is even more in the future is going to be where the intersection of science and technology is going to be. So, to, I'm now going to start summarizing today's uh, session. So the idea in this class, as I said, is to dress up the scientific method, but in a way that is compatible with large data sets and help you how to think with data. So, most scientists actually don't think about the scientific method. They just do their experiments. But what I'm saying is that with big data becoming more and more common, you have to think about the method as much as the domain of study. So what do I mean by that? If you're a biologist and you want to study the microbiome, it's not enough to just know what kind of species of bacteria are there one by one, because you will never be able to understand a hundred you know, billion bacteria in your gut 
by studying them one by one. Right? So something called metagenomics is arising, where the idea is you sample a little bit of bacteria from somebody's gut or some other, like or ponds come from, from some water, and through very rapid testing, you simultaneously identify what the bacterial species are in that sample. So instead of doing you know, genome sequencing one by one by one, you do it simultaneously for the entire sample. That's actually where a lot of this is going to go. And to do that well, you are need to understand data analytics as much as uh, how microorganisms work. Right? So that kind of heavily analytic you know, data processing will, I think, be very, very crucial in pretty much any kind of inquiry. So, and it will be as important, I hope, and I think, for people who are studying, you know, conflict or caste or, you know, Sanskrit texts or any of those things. Okay? So, to summarize, to think with big data, we'll have to build something like an additional sense organ, right? So think of a data analysis machine as giving you an additional sense organ, it's like your sixth sense. Okay? We're not anywhere close to that, but in this course we'll at least help you, suppose that that was going to be your grand challenge, well this will give you the, you know, class one version of that. Right? You have a very, very long so this course is therefore about developing the cognitive tools, so the thinking tools to help us uh, understand data. We will develop these ideas in a structured way. So from next week on, uh, so next week will be Anand, and then every week we will have sort of a specific topic that we will engage with. The syllabus will be posted online. It's already there mostly in the page of the course. And uh, with the projects and the structured courseware, hopefully you'll get some interesting uh, analytic tools, right? But remember again, people don't think of data. We actually are not data-driven thinkers, we are actually story-driven thinkers, or metaphor-driven thinkers. So one of the challenges of visualization, communication, analysis is how do you make data more presentable to people in such a way that they understand it? And that's really going to be our challenge